Jamo with the banger. Happy Thursday. Thursday. Last one of January. Last one of January. So uh, let me introduce our guest today. We got my boy Sam. Um, Sam oh, is is a graduate of NYU. He studied the same thing as us, sure. sports management. We had a great time. I'm glad I met him. Uh, built a good relationship with my boy here. Um, and I'll have you just talk a little bit about yourself, bro. Give us some background, man. Yeah, you so I'm mean, Unlike these fools, I'm originally from the New York area. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to one of my local schools in NYU. I've always really been passionate within the sports industry, sports tech, sports betting, anything being a sports fan, anything sports related, just personally has always related to me, like ever since I was two years old and even now I'm 23. So yeah, I mean, with that being said, throughout my studies, I've always like tried to intern in sports, like just like work in sports. And now like as a recent graduate, I'm currently working at a sports betting technology startup. And, uh, and like uh, that whole industry right now is just booming, like a lot of waves. So we're just trying to... Uh, kind of build off of that and just uh, gain some users and some market share that's awesome man so um where do you where do you think sports betting is gonna go because i know they obviously legalize yeah. it in a lot of different places yeah, I mean, it, what's next I think, yeah so i think it's one of those things that it's kind of the thing that it goes on it goes on anyway and like the government are just fools for not fully embracing it and, and legalizing it and it's kind of the thing that in a lot of places like like especially in like jersey nevada let's say Michigan where like sports banks already legal. Yeah. So there you see, you're seeing this turn into a huge business. Cause right now it's licensed through the, 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 the gambling operators, like casinos, like the fan duels, the draft Kings, the points bet. And which is good. Cause we live in like an open economy. I mean, unless mm-hmm. you saw it today, but uh, we live in an open economy. Like, shout out to <laughs> yeah. who's on GameStop and, uh, we'll talk about that. We'll definitely yeah. get into okay. that. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, interested yeah. to hear For what sure. you got to say. All right, so that's what I was saying. So like in these States, like Michigan, Jersey, Nevada, it's like a, it's just like an open competition. Whereas like these casinos, mm-hmm. like they try to make as much money as possible, but I think the real future for gaming and it's what, it's what's going on in Oregon right now. And governor Cuomo in New York actually recently proposed this. It's that they want to legalize sports betting, but through the state lotteries, the state benefits off this, not a third mm-hmm. party, not like an Australian owned points bet or a British owned uh, Patty power fan duel. You know, they want like, the New York and the local state government to benefit. So I think like that's the real future of sports betting that's how to be sustainable well how how, um right now specifically i mean uh, Mm -hmm. in sports in general everything else is kind of um going through hell you know sports franchises aren't really uh don't have any futures they don't know exactly what's gonna what's gonna happen in regards to attendance and and the money that's gonna come in um but sports betting has been the one thing that's continuously been showing growth over the last year mostly because more people are watching games and, and paying more attention to them uh, from home and they want to be engaged to their betting and their gambling. Um, how's that impacted your business, your company? And, and give it a little shout out. Just talk a little bit yeah, about no, it and, and so, how you guys have been able to do. Yeah, no, thanks a lot, man. Really appreciate that. So we're called uh, No House Advantage. And uh, we focus on player prop betting, which is a, it's a form of a daily fantasy sports, which uh, there's two separate laws. So there's sports outright sports gambling, which is like, only legal in like nine states, let's say, like as, as I briefly alluded to before, like Michigan, Nevada, Tennessee, New Jersey, whatever. So we work in daily fantasy sports, which is which is legal in, th- in upwards of 35 states. And that's what, how DraftKings and FanDuel started. Like you pick a line of every single day. But what's really unique about us is we're called no house advantage, meaning that you, you make picks without a house advantage. So like, and we focus on player prop betting lines. So like LeBron James averaging 20, 25 points a game. So for tonight's matchup, it would be LeBron James over under 20, 25 and a half points. And everyone would have access to this pick. It's not like someone else like bets like minus 110 and the next person gets a line at minus 115. At, at my platform, like there's zero house advantage whatsoever. Everyone's, everyone's uh, granted the same pick as the next guy. And uh, 
And yeah, so TJ, as you were saying before, like uh, what's been going on right now in terms of like where we're at with the current climate. So, I mean, just like any other line of work in like March, April, May time, like we were, we were completely done, you know, like, cause we bet on sports and there's no live sports then. And like, that was just very difficult, like internally within the organization, like, you know, like we shifted many times, like we took that as an opportunity to, to redo the platform. I mean, partially because we want to redo the platform, but also because there was not much going on. But I mean, thankfully, once like baseball returned in like June, July time, the NBA, like it's been booming, honestly, like there's been games nonstop. And I mean, thank God, like it's been doing really well and uh, and really growing. And now we're, we're currently after a successful NFL season, we're starting to search for our Series A round of funding. So it's been going really well. That's good. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. Sounds thank great. You, appreciate that. you know, it's crazy because I feel like uh, sports betting and even invest investing in stocks, crypto has been like such a uh, a forefront of the culture, so to speak, yeah. like in, in recent uh, weeks, days, even, um, you know, we see AMC, GameStop, and all those different companies that actually are kind of making Robin Hood second guess a lot of the investments. I think they put a block and a hold on most people's investments right now yeah. that are invested into those specific stocks. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts? Have you kind of indulged in any yeah. of that? Um, yeah, so... Course, I mean, uh, we're definitely seeing, uh, and similar to Robinhood, I assume, that we're definitely seeing an increase in first-time users. Because I feel mm -hmm. like right now, everyone's just stuck at home. There's not much going yeah. out. And, and I genuinely think that, like, what what, what would be, like, a $7 beer on a Thursday night in New York City is now going to be a $7 bet. You know, that's, that's really how it's been working out. Like, And also, yeah. like, you see, like, right now, especially, like, I mean, a little off topic, but, like, in the, in the, stock, in the stock market, like, a very big thing right now is SPACs, like, special special acquisition corporations and 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 that means like everyone just buys ten dollars and this company would merge with another company like similar to what DraftKings did and basically like i think that now like people are more willing to invest their money and, and spend their money and like kind of risk your endeavors because they're not going out and they have all this disposable income and they're like what am i going to do with this like i want yeah. to trip tomorrow so yeah. just like it's a very yeah. funny dynamic we're seeing well, let, let me ask you for, to, to kind of go on what Paris was saying there. Um, obviously, the news this week is 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 kind of uh, what's been going on with GameStop and, and now AMC. So I'm kind of curious, like from your point of view with the, with the yeah. work you've done, just for people who, who would be watching this, might not who might not know what's going on or trying to keep up to date. Essentially, from what I've gathered, essentially high end investors um, decided to short um, uh, GameStop stocks. Uh, now, anybody knows GameStop was a company. It is still a company that that sells and kind of buys and trades video games, something that we all know very well in our generation and some kids older than us uh, know as well. Um, and essentially, due to the fact that these investors decided to and fund managers decided to short the stock, um, they were betting on the stock to go down. A bunch of kids, essentially, like 20 year old, 30 year old kids on Reddit decided to group in their money together and invest in GameStop to raise the price of the stocks um, and then essentially these, these buyers would have to uh, continue to, to invest into the company now to, uh, to kind of balance out the, the mistake they made earlier. Um, a lot of people were using different apps to do this. Uh, we have friends that uh, invest in stocks uh, regularly, Robinhood, other ones come to mind. And now a couple of days into it, that trend went into AMC and some other of like kind of like these Nokia. kind of consumer yeah. hotspots. Yeah, Black consumer Black hot spots. Blockbuster, Blackberry, like Blockbuster, like old school, Crazy. like cultural, like iconic kind of things for our generation and the yeah, generation. Bed Bath and Beyond as well. Bed Bath yeah. and Beyond, and so and so. I'm curious, like in your opinion, yeah. now obviously there's regulation mm -hmm. uh, by some of these companies in preventing. Yeah. Uh, people from doing this, from from raising mm -hmm. the price of their of these companies, and therefore hurting these uh, massive investors um, financially. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I know you brought it up a little earlier, so I'm curious, like how your company is looking at it and stuff <laughs> yeah, like that. So, so I mean, that's a it's a very heavy question, and like you want my personal, yeah. opinion, like uh, completely off the record, but I do think what these head what, what these hedge fund CEOs are doing is no different than a, than what a guy like Pete Rose was doing. You know, like they're betting. You know, like they're betting on themselves, yeah. betting on the stock market. You know, like it, mm -hmm. it's, it's just like it's a like freedom for them, but not like for the regular man. And it goes a step further, and, and mm -hmm. actually goes a step further than that, TJ. Like, like I don't don't quote me on this, and like this is probably ninety percent of how it works. But I know like Robin yeah. in particular, the way Robin Hood would work is that it's no fee trading, and they have deals with like various hedge funds that like they sell all the all, all the customer data to these hedge funds. 
And yeah. like in return, the hedge funds would buy like these person's positions for like a fraction of a cent more just, and, and they do that like tens of thousands of times a day, which they do, they make millions of dollars. And that's how Robin Hood does like no fee trading. It's an ironic name for a company, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> no, I'll take a step further. So, so on Robin Hood, about 40% of the, of this data is sold to a firm called Citadel. And Citadel okay. has one of the largest short, short positions on GameStop. And then wow. like, and Robin Hood doesn't let you trade GameStop anymore. So it's, it's a huge yep. risk. And I was yeah. actually reading online that they're gonna tr- they're gonna change the name of Robin Hood from Robin Hood to Robin the Hood, because that's what they're doing, man. They can make <laughs> Robin the Hood. <laughs> is that supposed to be woke or some shit? Like, is that oh, like? <laughs> are they playing to the? I hate it, bro. I hate the yeah. whole thing is just so yeah, whack. I don't even. Why would man. they change their name though? Like to no, not why actually, is that the name that they're. That's they should have changed their logo to Russell Crowe from the movie. Of yeah. him just like super angry because everyone's pissed. That'd be hilarious. That's hilarious. Some memes yeah. troll. Maybe that's a meme. Maybe we'll see that meme in, a, in a, like the next day or two. But yeah. it's funny because I was thinking about remember EB Games. You ever yeah. Remember? What if that's the next thing? Like what if that? I, I maybe it's, what, it has to cease things history. Did they? Okay. I think so. if I had to okay. guess, we're like, there's no way they're around anymore. Dude, where, yeah, where's yeah. Toys R Us, bro? Yeah. Where's Toys? Where's that, Toys R Us, dude? That, <laughs> they still they, they still have on time. Uh, no, me, I think they're retailers. done. I think Toys R Us is they're like cease to exist. It's completely. done. They cease to exist. Except for like, there's yeah. an abandoned yeah. one near my friend's house. In yeah, exactly. You still see the sign up yeah, there. Yeah, it's sad, man. <laughs> and like the 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 tile colored tiles. Yeah, that was oh, that shit was that was a uh, Toys R Us. I was surprised about the AMC one because I do think like when the pandemic opens like when things start opening up people get vaccinated hopefully by the summertime i will expect that like for a couple of months there like amc regal these like mainstream uh, uh movie theaters are going to see a lot of business early on just because people are going to want to come in and experience the movies again they're going to have to probably open it up slowly though so that's going to hurt them uh profit wise but then you know you get a couple of months of that and then my guess is people kind of go back to like the the business as usual like the way it was during the pandemic where they're like i can just watch shit from home now i don't even have to go to the movie theaters and like there's this the section of us that love going to the movie theaters and then there's like the other 80 percent that just go there because like that's when a new release comes in if they get a new release that comes on hbo max or comes on netflix they may not go to the movies anymore after you know a couple of months yeah, yeah my thing with that is dude it's like I'm not gonna go like I still haven't watched Tenet for for example because that's same, like a, a total yep. theater movie you got to go to the theaters to get the sound the whole aspect of the entire film and it's kind of bizarre to to think about like what if you went to like Dunkirk or some war movie you know what I'm saying yeah. like and there's a lot of like like bomb the, versus versus yeah. Godzilla like stuff like that but yeah. go ahead Sam would you it's actually yeah. funny you're that Paris because apparently there's a new uh James Bond movie called yeah. no, no Time to no Die, time to and, die. They, yeah. and uh they must have delayed it about three to four times because they're yeah, waiting probably for people, they're waiting for people to get back to the theaters because like it, it I genuinely think it hurts the cinematography it when, uh, when, when yep. you're watching on, on a 12 inch screen as opposed to like the big screen, you know? It's, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah. Like even in a big flat screen TV, it's still not the same, man. I mean, I mean you can yeah. make it as close to it as possible with surround sound and no, different things no, like that. No, you need the ambiance. Exactly. It's just the experience, sure. bro. It it's like you're with all man. these people. Got There's like own. a gravity to it, uh, to the movie. You had to get out of bed uh, and go watch it, which means it's like <laughs> an event. So it's like you're getting ready for you get all dressed this up, maybe it's a the day. adrenaline's running, exactly. Down, you need yeah. all that to happen when you're watching a, a movie of that kind of quality, yeah. you know? You hit up, you hit up, you know, you know, uh, third, third Ave AMC right there on 12th Street. Yep. You, get that you bring, Thursday you discount. Your, you bring your big discount. ass water bottle and finesse the, the whole system. We get some free snacks, free Slurpee, yeah. all that stuff. Yep. Fill it up because they don't even notice. Go in there and go hang out <laughs> and have a good day. Dude, I used to bring my dinners into there. I would like cook that shit <laughs> in a Tupperware. <laughs> Bring a fucking full on burrito. Yeah, bro. Yeah, remember that shit? Little chips and salsa. You're sitting around the whole thing. You're sitting there with a fork and knife, bro, cutting through your food and shit. Get a little margarita going, a little brew. Open the fucking can, the bottle. It's hilarious, bro. But yeah, man. So let me let me ask you this. So we had our boy Jameson on last week. He's still at NYU studying during the pandemic. So obviously, we graduated during the pandemic. So I just want to hear your thoughts of just your journey through NYU and how we culminated mm-hmm. in kind of like this yeah. messed up situation. Yeah. I mean, it, I thought NYU was an incredible institution, like world renowned university of access to incredible resources here in New York. 
and abroad. Like I, I had the privilege to study in Prague for a semester. I studied in Tel Aviv for an entire semester. It, it was awesome in that sense. Like met incredible people, had, had great professors. But I mean, like at certain times I felt like they taught us more like concepts as opposed to like things that you can actually execute on. And like very often, like they, they went like too high level and didn't like focus on like steps, steps one and two, which, which I think like kind of, uh, kind of, kind of hurts the experience a little bit, but I mean, like overall, I thought it was a very good experience. And like, I think NYU is a tremendous school, but like the way we ended, like it was kind of abruptly, like it was, it was, culmin- it was four years of, of hard work, a complete culmination in, into absolutely nothing. And like, it was just very difficult because like we went from being students, then overnight we're at home and then overnight we're graduated into the real world. And like, at times I feel like I did not really have the university's support as much as I would have really have liked to in terms of finding like the next step and going through that process. I mean, like yeah. I definitely could have extended myself a little more, but at the same time, it was a very difficult situation both like mentally, physically, and all those things. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, like, I, I thought it was a good university, but just like any, any other, any other like institution, like there will be some issues with it. But uh, I mean, like, I, I, I had a good time, I would say. Yeah. So what do you think about SPS specifically? Like our, yeah, like uh, that's our group, right? Yeah, 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 that's yeah. our so, uh, major. What do you think about yeah, that school? Yeah. So I mean, like SPS, SPS in particular. So uh, I was actually having a conversation with someone about this the other, the other day. And I just felt like in the sports management program, you're hit with like a really unique mix of people because I would say about like 50% of the people are super motivated and like they're there because they love sports or they love entrepreneurship and they really just want to make an impact they want to make a difference and that's awesome and that's Mm -hmm. really like that's who you want to surround yourself with when you're learning when you're building your network which is great and then there's a bottom 50% I would say that are just there because like it's one of like the the relatively easier programs to get into an NYU and these people kind of just like half-ass it and like and if you half-ass things I personally think that it's gonna, the, the only thing you're half-assing is yourself and like and, and, and this will and this will bite this will come back to bite them in the ass one day and like and it's a little frustrating because i felt like at the time at, at the time as a student like a lot of people like, wouldn't necessarily contribute to like the general conversation of class yep. and they wouldn't hear their yep. opinion and i just felt yeah. like they kind of took away a bit yeah man and so kind of piggyback off that i <laughs> you know i've developed a lot of good relationships with professors um and a lot of them post-graduation, I, I go back and ask them, oh, how's your new class? How's your, the new freshman, for instance, or whatever it is? And they always say semester after semester, man, it's getting like worse and worse because people are disengaged. Um, and a lot of the times it's the internationals that come and they're not really, they don't even, I don't feel like they make an effort to assimilate to the culture, yeah. to the classroom, into the discussion, mm-hmm. to the overall yeah. Uh, learning uh, aspect of the, of the university, so to speak, man. So it's like, you know, what do you think about that? No, I mean, like, I, I don't really mean to like interrupt you, but, but I think it's kind of the thing that you said about the international. I, I can only speak for SPS sports. That's what yeah. I experienced. Yeah. So like, with that being said, I think a lot of the issue with the, with the international students, in particular, like having difficulties assimilate assimilating, is because I I think a lot of the course load is not assimilated to the international students. I think we live in New York City, which is one of the most global cities in the world. We're studying sports, which is one of the most global industries in the world. Yet we've learned yeah. minimal about soccer, like touched upon the briefly touched upon the Olympics, like didn't really learn about like rugby or cricket, like some real international sports. Like, you know, all, and all we do is focus on on the MLB and like the NFL is great. NFL yeah. is a gold standard for all professional sports leagues, but the MLB is a dead league and like and like I, I love baseball, but like <laughs> And that's what they teach us. Yeah. Like, come on, like adapt to the times. Yeah. No, I, I I totally agree with you. That's a great point yeah. because it, from thinking about it from that kind of view, because I agree too that there is a problem. There's obviously the language problem of like there's a comfortability in the classroom and you get all that stuff. Um, that there's a group of us that like would kind of lead into conversations. We would ask the questions. Yeah. We would be discussing. <laughs> yeah. It was us basically three. us three and a couple other and guys couple other, and, yeah. and some girls. Yeah. And it's like Just when you, you have. Sorry. Yeah, I, I was gonna say it just gets incredibly awkward because like you're in a, you're in a classroom of like 30, 35 people, and only six people yeah. are in the conversation. That means like the teacher always looks at this group of five, six people, and if no one says yeah. anything in that five or six group, then, then like you move on, you know, and and, mm-hmm. and, and, and prohibits the other yeah. people from asking totally. normal questions. Such totally. a bad no, I, and that's the thing though. Like I agreed with you as well. Like in regards to the international sports, yeah. like we're talking very uh, regularly. I would do cl- presentations 
on like cricket or yeah. I would do, you know, football or I would do rugby or something, but mostly like align with some international sports. So I could kind of like talk about something new because we talk about the big three NFL, NBA, MLB every single day. And I feel like that does alienate the, those students from international, uh, from like different countries. Now, most of them end up coming from China from what I see, but there's some from Brazil. Like we had friends from Brazil and stuff like that. And like they, their sport's soccer. Like that's their sport or their sport. They know more about the Olympics or they know more about e-games. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so in esports, and like, that's not games. being talked about <laughs> e-games. <laughs> that's not being talked about, you know, much in class. And they'll bring it up like relatively like, oh, there's this cool new thing called esports. Like, yo, we know what the hell that is. Like we, <laughs> we're living it. Like we, we know what, let's talk, let's get into actual conversations about it. Let's actually go in depth. Maybe these kids would start talking a little bit more, start participating more in class. But if you, just do those big three sports they don't know as much about it because they didn't watch it growing up like we did well you know you know a kind of counter argument to that is that you're coming to the school in the states to yeah learn about the ways of american life uh maybe mm -hmm. to better your life maybe you came from i mean obviously people that come internationally to nyu are paying seventy five thousand dollars, so obviously their life is pretty dandy and fine yeah, wherever yeah, the hell yeah. they came from having said that they should still they're in an American school. They're in American culture, American city. They need to assimilate. Learn to, about it. Yeah. Learn at least be open yeah. to learning. But having exactly. said that, I do agree. We should talk more about like, I don't fuck with esports because that's e-games to me. I don't agree. I don't think it's for it. I don't think it should be <laughs> categorized with. Exactly. I yeah. play fucking esports all the time, bro. Late night playing Call of Duty. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's a game, bro. It's not a sport. It's not like it's a, a game. Athletic. Yeah. You don't have athletic abilities to play it. And I respect the hell out of it. Where it's come from, how it's grown so much, how it's like mm -hmm. such a big, massive part of the world today. I think it's great, but don't categorize it with baseball and basketball, hockey, anything like that, because the toll it takes on a human's body to play those sports is inconceivably more than moving your thumbs yeah. Yeah. or wrist with the, yeah. like, the mouse, you know, <laughs> fingers, whatever the hell you're doing. But I think, uh, the, you know, I mean, like personally speaking, I, I'm also a lot more of a traditionalist when it comes to sport like you, Paris. Yeah. yeah. But I, I do think the one primary benefit of esports is the is the inclusivity aspect of mm -hmm. it. I think like anyone can play it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like I any agree. walk of life. And I think like that, that that's really important, especially in today's culture. Yeah. And even like we talked a lot about um, you know, handicap and disability within sport and how that uh in turn translates to legal aspects of playing and stuff like that. But like yeah. if you think of esports, there's people playing without hands, there's people playing yeah. without thumbs, whatever it is. So and like you said, it's university played, yeah. everyone has the ability to play it if they try and if they want to learn. Yeah. And the, the learning curve is easier to acclimate to as opposed to baseball. Cause like, if you get to the higher yeah. levels, if you're not a big dude. If you're not super strong, you're probably not going to make it. Maybe you're, unless you're like a Jose Altuve, Dustin Pedroia or something like that. But yeah. the chance of you making it is very slim to compare to esports where you have a larger opportunity, a bigger window to grasp and to get involved with. But yeah, man, super no, super no doubt. Stuff. That's, that's true. Like you need to have, like these, these students are, they know they're coming here to New York. They're to experience American culture, American society, what we're about in regards to sports. If not, they could have gone to another university somewhere else and also learned about sports. Um, and, I, and I agree in the sense of the traditional view. I think we need to have a mix. Like we need to have that traditional traditionalist view of these are the great sports that have done incredibly well in this country and for a particular reason. Let's learn about why. Let's learn, learn about how they've uh, adjusted over the years and how they've gotten better. And then, you know, at the same time, like to those students that are uh, are from America, like for us, you know, kind of get into like those deeper conversations also about like those international sports like soccer what makes soccer great around the world what makes cricket a top sport around the world because I think that'll help us because when we are starting to get jobs in this field you know there's a good chance a lot of us are going to be moving to other countries and, and other areas and having to learn about the the way sports is done over there as well as, as these students that came over here um, but yeah I mean to, to, like kind of what Sam said like that's kind of what our program was about essentially like if you tried if you worked hard if you really cared if you paid attention you were going to enjoy it if you didn't if you chose not to engage you weren't going to get much out of it yeah <clears throat> so very diff difficult uh, dynamic so kind of just uh, rounding this out let's get back to our initial topic conversation in sports bet so like we have the game of the yeah. year about a week away we've got the super bowl we have the yeah. Kansas City chiefs uh taking on Tampa Bay buccaneers Chiefs are favored by about three points. Uh, it's three and a half, right? It's like three and a half yeah. points or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. three and a half, three. That's what what do you guys like in this? <laughs> got Tampa, man. 
I said that shit. Don't bet against Brady. <laughs> I said that shit. I said I, I, I'm perfect so far in yeah. the playoffs. Um, I'm actually – I called this Super Bowl from the beginning of the season, so. It's, yeah, no. I, I was sticking with Tampa Bay, bro. Let's see if AB Chiefs plays. Win, that's going to be big. I think that Tony – Like a big point for Al Ryan. Uh, you like him all right, all right. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking the the Bucks win. I think the yeah. Bucks are gonna win too. I I don't want them to though. I don't want them to. I want the Chiefs no. to win. I I don't want them to because I'm a Carolina Panthers fan and I don't want to root for another divisional rival to win. But it's mm-hmm. Tom Brady and I have respect for Tom Brady. Um, and what he's done throughout the, you know, this playoffs. Um, but if there's one other quarterback, I would honestly take any day of the week. In a game like this against Tom Brady, it's only Patrick Mahomes. There's no one even close. These are the two. Tom Brady's the clutchest quarterback we've ever seen. Patrick Mahomes looks like he's going to be the uh, the second clutchest, if not the clutchest eventually. And we're going we're gonna to see because I think if he loses, he's never going to be able to live that down. I think it's going to be tough for him to ever become the greatest if he lost to Tom Brady in the Super Bowl. You know what I mean? Yeah. But if he beats him, if he beats him now in like six, seven, eight years, if he's got five, six rings – I think he's. I think he's got yeah. it. I think he'll get it. I think that's the respect he'll be owed because of the fact that he went against the goat and beat him. So the winner of this game will be the goat, in my opinion, of all time. Twenty, thirty years down from the road, down the road from now. You know, that's a heavy statement about a about a twenty five year old Patrick Mahomes. But I mean, uh, <laughs> he's a dog. He's a he dog. He's done it two years. years? Does yeah. he play fifteen I mean, like, more years? Maybe ten. I think ten for sure. Clearly, where he's heading. Yeah, I mean, like, I would say, like, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of more similar to Paris, and it's like I, a little bit the opposite to you, TJ. So I'm gonna place money on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to win, but I do think the Kansas City Chiefs will win because I think, I think Chiefs are the best team. I think they've been the most dominant team in the league all season. But like, I, but as a loyal sports fan, as like someone who likes to gamble, like, I, I can't sit down and watch this game and see Tom Brady win, win his record seventh Super Bowl. And uh, and be mad about and not that. be part of it and not yeah. be part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Missed that. I lo- that. I was on the Chiefs. You know, like I won't be able to live with myself. And yeah. I do really like the box. I think they have yeah. great defense. I think they're they have very good weapons offensively. I think they have great coaching, and they're at home. You know, that that'll only help. So if Brady wins, does this uh, taint Belichick's legacy in no, any way? No, no. Okay. No. I don't think so. I don't think so either. Yeah. Legend, man. Yeah. Yeah. It just it just yeah. moves up Brady's. It just makes him yeah. look like a big yeah. dog, you know. Yeah. It makes him definitively the goat, and I don't think anyone will ever be able to supplant supplant that because he's done it with two teams over what twenty five years. To me, that's like hard to ever supplant, even if you know Patrick Mahomes goes off on this amazing run over the next decade or so. I just don't see it. It can't you can't compare it to that. Uh, yeah. Sam, I'm curious real quick because we had this conversation a while back. Do you think Tyreek Hill is a top five receiver? In the NFL. Well, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I want to hear his point of view. Because I had yes, clearly. Yeah, I mean, like, months it's a, ago, Paris was yes, and my and our boy Alex, who you've met, he yeah. said no, and he was talking shit about him, saying that Marcus, uh, what was his name, uh, Brown from the from the Ravens was equal as oh, a oh, Brown? No, Brown. no, 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 he's Brown. 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 I, I, I really don't like Hollywood. <laughs> he, dude, he, he's a stick, you know, like he's yeah. kind of trash. The thing about yeah. Hill is like is like I would say he's a top five receiver, probably number five, let's say. But it's kind of the thing that like over like a set of downs, like over a set of downs, like he's not like he's not the guy, but like over a game, over the course of one full game, he'll get like at yep. least one or two like forty yard receptions and just like yep. up the entire. He just blow it like he could be a throw up donuts the whole first half and then all of a sudden yeah. two plays and your fantasy and dude, against Tampa Bay, remember man. he had three yeah. tennies against Tampa yeah, Bay. Yeah, I know, <laughs> man. Like, I know. And I'm saying, like, if, I'm saying every receiver in the NFL wants to do that, you know? Like, there's not many. Yeah. <laughs> he's like the X factor. He's the prototypical X factor. He isn't going to be throughout the game. He's not the number one always. Like, Travis Kelsey's there. But you put him on any other team, and he'll make these dynamic plays where, like, you watch the touchdown from last week. That wasn't, like, as good, great as Patrick Mahomes plays. And I always hype him up because I love him. That ball was just, like, a 10-yard slant, like, 15-yard, like, dig. And he took that to the crib all by himself. <laughs> like, that's the, that's, the extra, <laughs> that's the extra juice that these other receivers, yeah. other than, like, Devontae and the top guys, don't have. 
have. Like they can't do that. Like Marquise Brown, just send him on a go, send him yeah. on a go, send him on a go to the, to the back of the end zone. And he keep on, he can keep on running. He'll beat anybody like that, but he ain't going to run like a 15 yard dig and take it to the house. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, man. Yeah. yeah. Well, man, I really appreciate you coming on, Sam. Uh, okay. Miss you out there. I hope you're, hope you're doing well. Um, maybe when me and TJ make it back to the East Coast sometime yeah. in the near future, yeah. obviously we'll link up. But anyway, um, in the meantime, be safe, be healthy. Um, I'm really happy for your um, your business endeavors and everything with the sports Thank gambling, you. man. It sounds super interesting and fascinating. And um, best of luck, bro. Best of luck. Appreciate that, uh, best of luck, Sam. Well, best of luck with the pod, guys. Let's go. Really appreciate great it. On. I mean, hopefully I can come through again and, uh, and talk. Yeah, we'd we'll love Most to have you on again, Most bro. Definitely. Get to uh, some more conversations about some yeah. stuff. Awesome. Love it, guys. Thank you. And uh, All right. Best of luck again. All right, bro. Peace out, bro. Peace out. So, man, let's, uh, let's just jump into a little fit of the week here. Uh, a little fit of the week. I got some... Uh, Maybe maybe this makes. I look sense. forward to this every week, bro, because I want to see what you pull up. You know what I mean? Because I'm like, I don't know what you're thinking. Obviously, this was a big week. Uh, so much happened. Um, and uh, yeah, Kobe, bro. So that's, this is this is the Kobe Bryant edition, Kobe. dude. Yep. Look at this man. Look at this. This is like early 2000s. Uh, little young Sas- Sasha Vujicic right here. Kobe's mm. obviously not playing today. He's- Maybe he broke his, his, his ring finger. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a fit, man. He had a little AF1s on. Can't go wrong with that. Mm-hmm. Little baggy daddies because I was in. Everything was bigger back in the t- early 2000s. It was just funny. This like, is remember, before load management too, bro. This He never was a load He doesn't know what that guy. is, bro. He like, broke he actually just got hurt, multiple bro. fingers and still went out and dropped <laughs> like 40 points, bro. Like, he break. probably tore his whole hand, bro. His whole arm was torn. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. yeah, all right, I guess I won't play. Like, fuck it. You know, not a pussy, bro. There's too many pussy <laughs> in the NBA today. Fucking Kawhi. Kakrai. Kakrai. Kakrai when Hey, oh, hey he did he did win that. He did get himself a chip though, bro, on his own. He got to respect, was, respect was, him. You gotta that respect was because him. that was because KD got hurt. Joel State, got Golden hurt. State wasn't fully healthy. Clay got either. hurt. And fucking Draymond can't do shit without those full. So like, what are you supposed to do? Yeah. And if they were all healthy, or at least at least if Steph and Clay were healthy, they would have fucked them over, bro. They would. Oh no doubt, them. it would have been a no sweep shot. or probably five games. Probably and look five at Toronto. Games. Toronto, I kind of feel bad for Toronto, but you know what I did call uh, Pascal Siakam is not taking the next step to be the superstar ever. No, dude, he never was gonna be. He's bro. only averaging like eighteen he points this year. year. Van Vliet is like yeah. running that squad now, man. Which I was I surprised. Really yeah, know. Kyle Lowry's fall. I remember I was right, and I was right about Kyle Lowry, bro. I said Kyle Lowry when he's like the when he's not the number three dude, and he's like now the number two dude. Ain't shit. He ain't well, shit. They also, to be fair, they also lock, lost Marcus All um, mm. and Abaka, which are like two massive. I think Abaka was events, big for them. That, that fucked them because they played. They had a good year last year. I thought from with yeah. like the talent that they had they did. after losing Kawhi, they definitely had a great year they last did. year. They were first. Were they first in the East? I think, dude. I think they were first or second. They yeah, went all the way. They, they, they did. Was it? Was it? They they won. They went to the the conference finals, or did they lose? The, uh, did they? They lost to Boston, or my. Miami. No, no, no. It was Miami. No, no, no. They Miami lost to beat Boston Miami. to go to the ship. Yeah, so they, they lost, lost to Miami the then, I think. Yeah. Finals, conference semifinals. I think they lost to Miami then. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, or they did. Boston. They, they did because they, they hit those stupid shots against them, I think. Yep. Anyway, yeah. bro. Uh, moving on. We got a little more. So this is a little more um, grown Kobe, I guess you could say. Mm. Oh, no. Sorry, Kobe. <laughs> they just, it was a weird it was a weird week because i was and i was texting you throughout the week just like thinking about it's been a full year since him and Gigi passed away and i remember mm-hmm. it's one of those moments where you remember what you were doing that day and we were sitting we were literally i think we woke up we went to the couch turned on the networks we're watching this all through the day just glued on at the on the sofa and it was a sunday i remember that too um and then we like and then when we went out like at night to get food or whatever, yeah. like everything was pitch black, like no one was out, like it was quiet. Like, and we were talking about that. It's yeah. just crazy. It's been a whole year, you know? And they had the Empire State building in purple and gold, which is, yeah. which is super cool, man. And they like shocked the whole world, bro. It was like yeah. a seismic wave that just spanned the globe because he had fans stretched far and wide. He was like a massive player in China too. Like, he was 
probably yeah. their their favorite player. And I always think back to when I was in elementary still, the Kobe uh, year the Dragons came out. And this was like when everyone knew, okay, damn, Kobe is like the, the shit in China. Like everyone loves Kobe. And like obviously yeah. he's he's a icon of LA, one of the one of the most um, prolific people to ever be a part of the LA community. Um, yeah. And he's, it's never gonna go away, bro. It's like time flies. It's already been a year that's crazy. And I don't think I don't think it's registered still for some people because everyone thought. You know, a lot yeah. of the NBA people say he's like a, a mortal, which he is going to be a mortal in all of our minds and history books. But like this guy really is deceased to exist on this earth. Yeah. Now. Like he's dead. That's crazy, bro. That is insane to think yeah. about. But, you know, one thing we could remember him about other than his rings, other than his uh, Oscar award other than his uh, basketball career is his fits, bro. This guy has some style, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, he, 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 I think him and Brady appeared on GQ in the two thousands, like the most out of any athlete, I think I probably, may be wrong. Don't call probably. me on that, but maybe, I know Brady maybe for Woods facts. was on there. Woods might've been Tiger on there. Tiger probably could have been on that, but Kobe and Brady are definitely better looking than Tiger Woods, bro. Like, give me a like, But yeah, I mean, I, was, I mean, Tiger Woods don't have hair, bro. And at least even well, Kobe, Kobe didn't have hair, hair but he, looks, he knew what's up. It looks up. right, yeah. though. It yeah, looks, it look he right. knows what's He knew he didn't have hair, bro. He knew he didn't yeah, have hair. He had the fro. He figured that out real he quick. He said, fro to yeah. the low, but I'm still going to look good, man. Yeah. He yeah. got all his fro right here on his little fur coat. That's his fro <laughs> one right here. He just dyed it. But, uh, you know, another one right, right here. This one this is, is a GQ, GQ? from 2009. Yeah. Oh my God. Voice crack. 2009. Um, yeah. Little earring. Little, little, that's something he never really wore earrings other than like the early 2000s. I remember. But Yeah. Uh, I don't like that's not what I remember. Uh, this is clean. Like, I never remember bro. wearing earrings. This it is, is like a, such clean. a nice fit. He looks like a, a little bit catch me if you can right here. Huh? Yeah, he's got he's got that DiCaprio vibes. He's got yeah. more of the the Tom Hanks. Tom vibes Hanks, vibes. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and then he got these two as well, also from the same shoot. That uh, basketball is dope. Yeah, like super they, cool. They painted super over cool. It or something. But That's something cool. You know, the NBA should do that. I know they have a different. Do they have a different ball for the All Star game? Maybe, but I think in like special they games they should have like a colored yeah. ball or something, or maybe for each mm -hmm. uh, playoff round there's like a different colored ball to signify the round. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be cool, man. Because you know, maybe the argument would be like, oh, that'll distract players because the ball's different color. Yeah. Wow, why would that distract people? It's the same ball. It's just a different color, man. It's very at least color. for like, at least for the, they definitely should have it for like opening night or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Christmas yeah. day, you know, have a holiday ball. Something like yeah, that. yeah, exactly. Halloween yeah, for, games. For the holidays, yeah, yeah. It'd be super cool. Um, this is the last one. So like a little black and white. Remember him. So I, let me ask you this. Um, what's your favorite memory of Kobe as a player? And just like, I don't know, what's your favorite memory of Kobe, yeah. man? Well, you know, since I was, I'm not a, you know, um, LA. a native uh, la -er, uh, Angelina. I, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I guess the moment I remember more than anything else is because it's probably when he dropped uh, 60, was how was 60, what was it, 62? On his last game, how much was it again? 60, 60. 60, yep. 60 right? 60. He dropped 60 in his last night. Crazy. Uh, that's what I remember more than anything else because it was – like when I, when you're younger, unless you're like a Lakers fan, like yep. where you like – you were there for the for the Shaq and him, you know, winning the rings and then Gasol yep. and him winning the rings. Unless you were there for all that, like that's not really in your memory when you think of Kobe – um, for me, it was like the end of his, the tail end of his career. Cause I never really got to see him and experience him from my memory mm -hmm. when he was like, when he was the best in, in basketball. Yeah. Um, and what I remember was like, you know, he had so many injuries when I was in high school, injury after injury, after injury. And, and, and clearly at that point, LeBron had taken over and he was the guy and he still kept back, kept on coming back and playing. And people would say, just retire, just give up all that. Um, and he wanted to kind of like show LA, like, no, this is who I am. This is how much I love the game. And then also teach these youngins that came in, like, this is how you play. This is how you, 
this is how you fight adversity. You leave on your, on your own, um, mm-hmm. in your own merits and you leave the way you want to leave. And then he had that last game against Utah and he dropped 60. And I, I think that for me, that resonated because I remember the morning after when I went to school and we were talking about it in class all day. Like that was what we were talking about. And yeah. so he had this ability to connect people in a way I've never seen, even in a way LeBron it has a hard time doing because with LeBron, there's this kind of, it's almost like with Brady where you love him or you hate him. With Kobe, everyone loved him. Everyone appreciated him. Everyone respected him. I think he came uh, in at a time, uh, I mean, we could obviously- I would say love him. That, I would but, say they respected him because like there's yeah. that whole Nike commercial where I hate you is like the thing because everyone hated Kobe, bro. No one like Kobe. Everyone I'm hated thinking, Kobe because he's so, so good, thinking, but they respected his game. You feel no, me? I'm, that's, that's what I'm different. saying. I, that's what, I, that's what uh, I mean is that it, there's, it wasn't like, like the people who didn't fuck with Kobe was more with like, it was more of a cultural thing. It was more of like the way he lived his life, Got his it. wife yeah. and all that shit. And, that, and all that was going on for people who were like fans of the game, who like with when it's like with LeBron, it, be, it became more of like either you you're with him or you're against him kind of thing. Or like Tom Brady, either like you admit he's the clearest, he's the goat of the goats or you're not. With him, it was different. It was like you respected his game. You knew he worked harder and more tirelessly than anybody else. He may not have been the most talented, but he was the hardest working athlete you'd ever seen. And so that gained the respect of everybody, regardless of whether you agreed with him or disagreed with him or whatever. And I think that was what brought people together is that he was this iconic figure that our generation truly needed. And I think his loss, the day he passed away, was so shocking because we expected so much to be to happen with him going forward. We expected him. We knew he was going to be a great entrepreneur, a great businessman. He was going to do a lot of things um, uh, socially, uh, a lot of things in regards to um, kind of uh, movies and film and entertainment, and then talking more about sports and 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 kind of raising a family and raising uh, a daughter who could one day become one of the greatest women's basketball players of all time and for it to abruptly ended on a helicopter flight some morning uh in the west coast is is crazy to me yeah. but but it does kind of it you remember that moment and it stays with you and it does kind of let you know like how you know life you got you can't take anything for granted anything could happen to anybody 100 percent, man and i think that for me with kobe like obviously i watched the majority of his games because i'm a obviously big time Laker fan, die hard, grew up in LA all my life, uh, modeled my sports career after Kobe. He's my idol and everything that I did, even in the classroom, even in the, in, the, in my career and the, uh, job force and all that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. and just shows you it, one thing he said, I think that really resonated with me and kind of shaped my mentality and outlook on life and how I carry myself is, he says, he goes, everybody gets nervous, but instead of allowing the nervousness to consume you, to alter your abilities, say, admit to yourself, yeah, I am nervous. And then identify why you're nervous. Maybe it's the championship game you're going to play. And maybe it's an interview you're going into say, okay, I'm nervous because I'm going into this interview. I need to impress this client. I need to impress this, this, uh, whoever the hell's interviewing you. And, um, just say, fuck this nervousness. Why do I need to be nervous when I'm doing my thing? Just go out there and leave it out on, on the table. Um, have no regrets in life. Have no regrets in this moment in time and kick some ass basically is the mentality. So that really helps me because I find myself a lot of the times, like, I mean, not to say I really was a nervous person and things like that, but I know a lot of people get nervous as you should. And I've been nervous at times. Um, maybe it's in a baseball game or something like that where i'm like fuck man like like damn i'm feeling it you know your heart's racing you got the butterflies going you got all this stuff happening to you but instead of like i said letting it consume you say say cool i am nervous so what so what doesn't matter let's go do this thing let me let me leave it all out there let me have this mama mentality where nothing else really matters not it's not like i don't give a shit type mentality it's more like if I lose, if I fail, I fail, but at least it'll be a learning experience in the process. And if I, if I try my best, hopefully I could, all the things to come to fruition and I could succeed in whatever endeavor I, I embark on. But my thing with Kobe as a basketball player, I remember I went to 
my first Laker game, which is insane. It took me a lot of years to go to Laker games, but I always watch it on TV. I'd always be shooting in the backyard post game, like, oh yeah, getting hype, you know, feeling yeah. feel myself a little bit, hitting the Kobe <laughs> shots, whatever. Um, yeah. And that's so weird because I even think back to my game and how I play even today. It's like, I always shoot better when people guard me really hard. <laughs> if I'm wide open, yeah. <laughs> I'll probably miss, I'll miss, I'll miss it more often than not. I, like, not going to lie, it's funny. But I yeah. just love people guarding me because I like that competition and that competitive nature that comes out of me when somebody's really going hard on me because it makes me go even further in my abilities and push myself harder. But with Kobe, like, getting back to what, what I was going with it, uh, I, I went to the first game I saw – him play live was the last game of whatever season it was it's maybe like even eight ten years ago uh against the utah jazz man and to come yeah full full 360 circle to his last game of his nba career against the of course utah jazz which is kind of crazy to think about and i remember the day he dropped 81 points i actually still have the cassette tape recording of it because like back in the day you had to record there was a TiVo that was in you know anything like that so mm-hmm. you had to yeah. record things on your cassette tape my dad recorded it for us and that day I had a game and I remember coming back from a, a win listening to it on the radio and then coming yeah. back to the tail end at home and that was really really cool but you know Kobe's he's my goat he's a lot of people's goats I still think he's the goat just based off the fact that he was the only one to actually challenge Michael Jordan in the sense that nobody really tried to actually emulate and be an exact replica of Jordan. They try to do things, yeah. Jordan do like win championships, do this and that. But he literally was like, I'm going to be Jordan, but I'm going to be a better version of Jordan. He didn't have the same athletic ability as Jordan. Yeah, he was super athletic yep. coming out of the league as a crazy dunker. He won a dunk contest. But, you know, yeah. he, he evolved, his game evolved so much because he took from Akeem Olajuwon, all the greats. Whereas you think of LeBron, LeBron's just like a freak of nature. LeBron's his own beast, his own animal, his own thing, his own type of goat doing his thing. Yeah. But Kobe's just a different, a different type of animal, bro. What was that? What was that ad? Um, are you uh, a different beast, but the same animal? Like, was it, remember that ad? With, yeah, uh, with dude. <laughs> yep. Yep. That was that was a crazy commercial, bro. It was a crazy commercial, but it, it it's you know it was him. That's who he was. Yeah. He was an inspirational figure to many, um, and he'll be dearly missed. Every year we'll be thinking about him and celebrating his accomplishments and what would have been his accomplishments because there's no doubt he would have. Hundred percent, bro. Hundred percent. All right, man. So so let's talk about another legend that passed, uh, Larry King. Yeah. Um, which is uh, his, one of his, or his son, uh, Chance King. I went to high school with him. Great guy. Really nice kid. Wow. Um, yeah. Shout out Chance. Hope you're doing well, brother. But uh, sorry for your loss, obviously, man. And, and I think that Larry King, he was like such a legendary talk show host. He was like one of the first talk show hosts I actually listened to growing up as a kid. And obviously yeah. I didn't like regularly watch yeah. it, but that was like what I knew CNN to be was Larry King. Larry yep. King Live was CNN, yep. and I, I I look back at a lot of his uh, guests and stuff, and most recently he had Mac Mac Miller on before he yep. passed, and like a lot yep. of people he's interviewed have passed away or passed away just before he passed away, which is so crazy. And I feel like people are mm-hmm. at least famous people for that matter dropping like flies, man. Like it's just insane to think about. In the past five years, especially the last two, it's like man this is just insane and i feel like people become yeah. numb to death which is like kind of sad to think about like the whole covid rate oh a million people around the world have died i think we just hit a million and people are like oh yeah. damn that sucks gosh darn but like dude that's a million people think about that think about that yeah. i understand it's a small percent small percentage of the world population but a million people have died bro and like most yeah. recently larry king so what do you what are your thoughts on larry king bro what's your relationship to him and like things dude like larry king i think is is the greatest um i think he's the greatest interviewer slash broadcaster ever interviewer for sure um you know with the work that he did uh from his early time on radio mm-hmm. and then as he got into you know the larry king show which I believe is on like a now defunct network, the MBS mutual broadcasting system. Um, And then he obviously went on to like, we saw him a lot on, which was on Larry King live on CNN. And he, to me was in a, had an acute ability to interview people in a way that was reasonable 
asked tough questions, really got into the, to the heart, to the meat of what people wanted to know. And he had this, uh, this attitude, this swagger to him yeah. where he was very well composed. Um, as you know, like he went through much, much of his life, even into his later life, still doing it, you know, you know, continuing um, with, with separate deals on like Hulu and all these different uh, uh, streaming uh, net, uh, sites and, and, and other networks, uh, uh, as well as doing his own thing, his own podcast and stuff. Um, and he has this, uh, this certain ability that I don't think a lot of uh, journalists, I mean, I, you could even consider him a journalist. I mean, he was everything. He was a journalist, an interviewer, a talk show host. He was everything. I don't know how many uh, today can do what he did where he would take an, a truly honest point of view, regardless of if he was interviewing like an actress or celebrity or a politician or somebody of, of, of importance and really had this way to connect with them. And because, you know, we, we see him as like an older figure, anyone who came on the show who was younger, you know, had this automatic respect for him when they talked to him and they were shocked to even be sitting in front of him. Yeah. And the way he would interview them by just asking basic questions, simple questions, and really talking more about the heart than about the head, I think that's going to be, um, we're going to miss that. I mean, I, I still watched his content the last few years. I would watch his uh, politicking show. I would watch some of his other interviews that he did online. Like, he really had this ability to, 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 to talk to people about different stuff and to get them to explore different things in a way that, you know, you know, today, you know, modern wise, you think Joe Rogan, someone who can do that, but he was yeah. something else. He really took an honest point of view. He wasn't biased in any conversation he went in, but if he heard some shit, he would call it out. Like he would, yeah. you know, I saw someone I, say I like, that. uh, you know, he kind of was, a, he's kind of an asshole sometimes. And that's why he was great is that he didn't take bullshit. Like you came on his show, you showed him respect. Um, if you, uh, if you said something bad about him, he's going to come at you. You know, and he had this kind of like, he's this godfather to so many people um, of just like, everyone remember, knows how he sounds, knows how he looks, and everyone has had him in their life at some kind of point. And I think he's going to be dearly missed, uh, probably more than any celebrity or person that I've over the last you know year or so, but we, we've been seeing them dropping like flies through this pandemic. And I don't know if he passed away from COVID or not, or COVID related symptoms. It seems like that's a possibility. Uh, and that just makes it even more sad because I saw so much of his content about COVID and how he's dealing with it and trying to tell like people who are 30 and 40, like take this seriously because I'm the one who's going to be dying from He'd this. I'm the one who could, the most, yeah. who could die from this. And that's what happened, it seems like. And that's sad, you know, it's sad. You know, I, I, I loved one thing about him. Just, I really, I mean, I didn't really watch him a lot, but I watched him a good amount. And just looking back at recent interviews that he did have, um, I love the fact that he, like you mentioned this a little earlier, but he liked to push people's buttons in a way. Like, so for instance, someone say, he like, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm really happy. Why are you happy? Why are you doing great? Yep. Boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom, blah, 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 blah. Okay, but why? The why, they keep asking to dig deeper and get things out yeah. of people, which is the ability to do that is so great because a lot of times people give you like these bullshit surface answers that are like, okay, but really what's going on in your life? And it shows that not only he cared, but he was interested. And I think that really allows people to open up more when they feel that somebody's interested in them or caring about their situation or their life. That allows people and enables people to, take down the walls or whatever they have going on with them and just let it all out. And I think that's yeah. one ability he had in a sense. He's kind of like a talk show healer, like not even trying yeah. to be, he just like naturally that's what he was. So when people, I think left the interview, they came out with, came out of it with like, Oh my God, that was really therapeutic for me. That was really, really cool. I, I yeah. talked about things that I didn't even think I knew about myself or knew that I was thinking in the back of my mind and he got it out of me. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's super duper cool to do. And that thing about uh, calling out bullshit is like, hell yeah, bro. I don't fucking take bullshit either, man. Yeah. I'll call this shit out. I don't give it a shit, man. You know, for, in for instance, I was, uh, I won't say this person's name, but he was like, you know, trying to be the ringleader of, of the groups of the social groups and stuff like this. I'm like, who, who is you, bro? <laughs> you know, who you is? Because, <laughs> because he was that guy yeah. that's like, you know, took the, the nice, naive people under his wing and like made him 
go along with everything he did and shit. So then when I came along into the group or into the social setting, I was like, I see what you're fucking doing, bro. I like you, but you ain't yeah. gonna do that shit to me, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, 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 I, was, I sent that shit out the first second I met you, bro. So don't even play yeah. with me. But, you know, that's one thing I say about myself. I think, I mean, obviously, I don't like to judge the uh, books by their covers, but I think that I could get a good sense of a human, of a person, of a personality, of somebody's aura so to speak, uh, within the first five minutes of meeting them, just because how they carry themselves, how they look, act, talk, walk, how they are hygienic with themselves. Like there's so many different factors. And I, I guess that's just because I'm, yeah. from my perspective, I'm very, um, very in tune to what's going on, I think. And a lot of times yeah. that's why the power of listening to me is the most important thing in life and listening with respect. You know, you, know, you yeah. could hear a person, but actually really, listening to what they're saying and taking it to heart and then judging it for your own self your own personal um wisdom and not and knowledge because that's something that i strive for i strive to have the most wisdom and knowledge possible you know i don't got to be the smartest dude that's why we're here i mean that's why we're absolutely bro and that's why you and i i think we we share this common bond and common personality and value that you know, we're not the fucking mathematician that's going to solve the equation of gravity. We're not the fucking yeah. dude that's Elon Musk that's going to build all these crazy SpaceX rocket ships and take us to Mars. We're the dudes that's going to give you wisdom, give us our two cents. If you like it, you don't. If you do, great. But this is just yeah. us talking, bro. And we're trying to, you know, just spread our spread our wisdom and love to the world and and have yeah. others come on the show so they could spread their own opinions and wisdom and everything it'd be cool. And that's what yeah. and that's what Larry King did at yeah, the end that's of the day. Did, I mean, that's a big these are the people we look up to because I, as you know for me, the reason I got into sports is because I always like to get talk about sports. So I always was mm-hmm. looking into career, into broadcasting, into yeah. a career, um, is working as a host one day. And so he's someone who you know, he's, to me, he taught me so much. And that's why I was always looking at his work and the way he went about uh, questioning and interviewing people. And it's also that, you know, we've lost some really good ones. We had Regis Philbin, obviously, that comes to mind as another great yeah. talk show host. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, David Letterman, we haven't lost yet, thank God. But he is another one. Like we, you know, we've kind of, we, we, we entered this phase now where I don't know if we're ever going to have that great late night talk show host or daytime talk show host. Um, that voice of the moment that we all can, that, uh, that, that people in America can come and kind of like all listen to and all respect. I think those days are gone and that sucks. And that's so sad because we need those kind of iconic people to, to maintain structure and order in society. Yeah. Um, and I think now we're just in this position where I feel like anybody who's an interview, anybody who's in, who's in, big time media it's tough like they have guidelines that they've put on them they've got railings that they put on them like you can only do x y and z you have to have this point of view on all of these issues so come from this biased point of view instead of what larry king did which is that there's no doubt larry king's more of a like a liberal open person but he also would respect people's point of views he would really like ask deep questions and ask like morally and ethically how the the views that one holds matches with their moral fabric with their ethical being with their inner desires and like you were talking about going deeper into questions and asking why and why not and how instead of just baseline Mm -hmm. questions that we get today um and that's going to be sorely missed especially for young people like us who really are engaged in this uh, this kind of new form of conversation and this new form of entertainment, uh, which is either podcasting or, or just any other online media space. 100%, man. And, you know, I think that the world we live in today, you have the Colberts, you have the Kimballs, you have the Fallons, um, Cordons. And I, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't lie. Yeah. I've never been a fan of, uh, what's Redhead? <laughs> Uh, Conan O'Brien. Conan, right? yeah, I'm, like a, Conan, I'm not yeah. a fan. And, I'm and not a fan I, of I think, his anymore I think either. Seth Meyers really is watching. super boring as well. Yeah, I, they're not bad. It's just like I don't. There's nothing yeah, I get from them. Yeah, you know? there's no, there's no bad. I think Fallon's there. probably the best. No, Kimmel's probably the best. I think. I like Kimmel Fallon and Corden's yeah, cool. Corden's Fallon's funny, okay. I think, but you know. Colbert, Colbert is really good, man. Got Colbert is good too. Colbert is good too. <laughs> he he he's just hates Donnie, but luckily, yeah. I don't know where's his content gonna go, you man. Remember, now that he's gone, you met, 
That's you remember Craig Ferguson, bro? Craig Ferguson. Yeah, that guy funny. was was hilarious, bro. Was. We need that's those personalities is what we're gonna miss. In addition to those like straight line interviewers, which yeah. aren't like any of the ones we have yeah. now, like a Larry King that was just straight line through the middle, like honest about everything, honest journalism. And that's what we need. We need people who are like that, who will are down to rock the boat once in a while yeah, to ask to, a tough question. To to ask a uh, tough question but at the same time doesn't take like a biased point of view in which they want their show to be about instead they really they listen to all sides of everything you know i agree with you man but you know yeah. let's uh let's talk about another individual that is coming to mind right now uh d watts deshaun watson d watts big news so this week, bro. Big, big news, news. he formally requested a trade today uh yes what is are your thoughts on that number one number yeah. two um houston sports is down the shitter bro they lost they lost their boy harden yeah. uh astros lost george springer they're on the downward trend the kind of window is closed i would say uh yeah and now the texans are like gonna blow up that entire franchise jj watts no i think the it's next been, domino it's, after that this was know. going to happen though because they yeah. There has been problems with the organization, the management, the culture, and Deshaun Watson. Uh, it's clear that this is more than just uh, miscommunication. This is Deshaun Watson being upset with the way the franchise is being run in Houston, uh, probably upset with the ownership, lack probably respect, upset man. with a lack of respect. I mean, you've got a franchise yeah. quarterback with you. You told him that you're going to – have him in on every single decision that is made at the management level. And then you decide to hire someone without his approval. In addition to that, you already have a situation where you know Deshaun Watson is working in the community. He's working towards uh, things like social justice and, and has different programs that he's put forth for children in Houston and, and different uh, communities in Houston. Yeah. And the ownership in many ways has been criticized in the past for some of the things that they've said, especially Bob McNair. And some of the things that had happened uh, in regards to this movement for uh, racial equity, movement for change. And I think that mixed alongside of what has happened with this particular incident has led to a situation uh, that that has caused us, in addition to obviously, how can we forget the, DeAndre Hopkins getting shipped out to Arizona, his number one receiver. And so at this point, that, there that was, was a the, lot of teams yeah. That's that's that was the really I think the crux of when they're not respecting him. 100%. And out of the quarterbacks that are left in the league at who are like less than thirty, I mean you got Patrick Mahomes and you think Deshaun Watson's number two. He's got the talent. I think he's got the ability. He's shown in college he can win tough games. He's not a he when given the shot to get to the playoffs and make plays. I think he can win games. And I think he's clearly a franchise quarterback that has the ability to take a team to multiple Super Bowls. So the question is, why yeah. wouldn't you as an organization make a move to get him now when there are right now he's in, he wants to leave. Uh, it looks like his number one and number two options, if I'm not mistaken, are the Jets and the Dolphins. I don't why know why the Jets are that high. Jets, it, makes, it makes no oh sense God, because the Jets dude. are also a shitty – the Jets are also a shitty organization. So I get the Dolphins. That makes sense. But the Jets makes no sense because the Dolphins fits with him, I think, culturally. They can trade to it, as too. Well as, That's the thing. Exactly. Like the Texans are like that. That's one thing they have to bargain with. So I don't know, oh, I don't know why that's that what he's, he's, he's doing. Exactly. It kind of messed up yeah i mean it would be wrecked but it's also like if you're you any of the move, other organizations like i'm thinking i'm thinking if you're chicago why not make the move now because you screwed up in the draft you should have taken him instead of or mahomes instead of Dude. uh trubisky yeah. you have all these teams yeah. that if they got a guy like uh deshaun i think they're in the playoffs and they're competing for a super bowl yeah. you could make a case for like an arizona arizona says i'll go straight kyler murray for deshaun watson and give him a pick you got Ray an upgraded quarterback and you bring him back with D Hop, and now you're happy. Now I obviously hope, I hope he comes to Carolina because I his third team on the list, according to the reports at least, third team on the list Which is one? Uh, Jets, Miami, and then it's Carolina. And the reason he's got Carolina at three oh, is because of the weapons. You got you got McCaffrey, bro. McCaffrey's a dog. You got three good receivers in, in Curtis Samuel, DJ Moore, and Robbie Anderson. You have a good coaching staff, a college coaching staff, so he might like that. And then also, he's from Atlanta. He's he went to school in uh, at Clemson University in South Carolina. Yeah. He's from the South, so he says I might be down to come back home. So I, if I'm Carolina and I'm sitting there at eight, 
in this draft, knowing I'm probably not going to get the top quarterback I want, you've then got to start asking yourself the question, do we have the team? Um, if we get that quarterback in there, who's a franchise quarterback, a great quarterback, one of the greats, yeah. can we go to this? Can we go to the Super Bowl? And I think the answer is yes. I think we could. And so I think we need to make that move. We need to take some risk because if you bring him in, I don't see how that backfires for your organization. Yeah. I don't see how bringing in Deshaun's going to backfire because you get a 24 year old, 25 year old. You could always rebuild again with him. Still exactly. With him franchise. being a key part. Yeah. Maybe one day McCaffrey has to go, one day one of these receivers has to go, but you can build around a young guy. He's not a 33 year old like Kirk Cousins. No, he's a, he's a dog. Man. He's a dog and he's young. I think every team should be calling up that front office, Bro. giving them as much as they want to get this guy. Dude, okay, obviously everyone knows that I'm a fucking Patriots fan. Yeah. We don't have a quarterback, bro. This is the time. Oh, you could get him. This is it. This and is Belichick never does good with first-round draft picks anyway. Give him all the picks. Who cares? We always find give people in the seventh, pick. sixth, fifth rounds. We don't give a shit. Undrafted. Yep. Dude, yep. Gunnar Olszewski, our Pro Bowl punt returner, where average yep. the most net yards per punt return in the last 10 years. Undrafted, bro. We don't need the fuck. Yeah. We don't fuck the draft. We don't need to do shit in that. Give them all the picks they want. Throw in, and we have the number one. We had the most cap, second most cap this off season. Godwin, yep. uh, Juju Smith, who I really lost so much respect for, but he is a Trojan. Fight on. Uh, uh, I don't know if you want him though. Bro. I don't want him. Belichick definitely doesn't yeah. want to take top or flip flop, whatever. <laughs> Cole Beasley, it. I don't Cole know if he's Beasley. available. Some there's a lot of dogs out with. there, bro. Um, uh, Kenny Galladay. There's a lot of receivers out there to get this off. Season. There are some good receivers out there. So you know, I think that I mean. I'm cheering for Carolina and New England. Def- no Miami, no Jets. No, we don't. Want, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see him straight. go anywhere else. I'm and sure I, the that. reason I think that Carolina has the best shot is simply because the Texans are in the AFC. That's and if true, you too. are a franchise and you know you have a great quarterback, you don't want to give that to any AFC team in your division, mm-hmm. uh, anyone else in the conference, because then you're going to have to play him to get to the Super Bowl. You yeah. don't want to do that. So you want to yeah. ship him the other other side and so i think that puts carolina in this perfect position, position it also right. gives atlanta a shot atlanta is a really good shot i don't know why they wouldn't go after him. they have a topper a higher pick at four so the texans would get a better quarterback in replacement um you've got great weaponry uh better than carolina even has and you have a new oc who's played against Deshaun Watson yeah. from Arthur Smith from the Titans. So I don't know why they wouldn't go after him. Now I hope to God they don't. Cause if he's in this division, oh, yeah, hey. Tom Brady, <laughs> bro, yeah. with Tom Brady. And then I don't know the saints will figure something out. Maybe yeah. not, maybe they won't, but you got those two guys. And then Deshaun for the next 15, it's over. It's over. You can't, you, what I think Carolina should just go man. get him. The saints oh, get him too, fuck. bro. Him, Anybody, Kamara, he could go, he could, he go anywhere. I just don't think the Texans will want to give them, give up a not get a high pick. They're going to yeah, want a high pick yeah, in return, definitely. or they're going to want a quarterback in return. So it's going to be like one of these Arizonas or something, a Detroit. Maybe they're stupid enough and they think Matt Stafford's going to look. Matt Stafford's a good quarterback. Don't get me wrong. He's a he could be he could have been a really good quarterback. I hope the with Patriots the right get him if we don't get Deshaun for sure. Yeah, no, because you're in a tough situation, though. You guys are in, like, 15, 14. You're in a tough yeah, situation where you well, can have bro. to we trade up to get well. the quarterback. Cam can't yeah. even lose right, bro. Like, Yeah, seven and nine, you can't even guy, lose right. Bro. Why, so bro? Bad. I, to- I told He's so you. so bad. He's a waste I have, of space. I have, this, I have this theory about him, which I won't reveal until maybe 10 years from now, um, <laughs> as to why. No, as to why he is. So like January this. 28th, twenty. Have- 20 31 you're gonna reveal yeah i'm not gonna because i I wanted to come out from his camp first i i'm making it's just a guess i have a personal respect for cam because i think he's gone through a lot in his life but i'm disappointed because he's never reached the true potential of what he should have been at the number one overall you know too much of this shit in the fucking you know the only evil hoodie master is belichick bro that's the only guy who can do that but you know we'll see we'll see uh gonna be interesting offseason for sure uh, yeah. curious to see what's going to crack in the draft with Trevor Lawrence and J- uh, Justin Fields, like what's going to happen with that. But, you know, it yeah. remains to be seen. Uh, also, sticking to the sports, we got the Hall of Fame, baseball, Hall of Fame, Cooperstown. For the ninth yeah. straight year, Bonds, Clemens, and and Kurt Schilling didn't make it. Kurt Schilling, yeah. Uh, I, I Kurt mean, I, did better than I thought he would. Dude, I 71%, do not bro. like Kurt Schilling at all. The guy's a kook. He's a clown. 
He's an asshole. Yeah. Um, he's a crazy dude, but I, I wouldn't think he deserves yeah, to be in the Hall. I, I mean, I wouldn't be mad if he did make it, but dude, fucking Barry Bonds needs to be in the Hall of yeah. Fame. Roger Clemens needs to be in the Hall of Fame, bro. Like, yeah. come the fuck on. Bro. I mean, for that, it's for insane. those two, it's just steroids. That's that's why they've not been. Yeah, but you know what's funny? It was never there. proven in the court. So what the fuck? That's true. None of them have been proven in the court. Yeah, though. I mean, yeah. Right, obviously the they the did it based on their McGuire physicality. Was looking proven at proven in the court, but yeah, they know they did it. Like they admitted to doing it eventually. Well, Bonds never A-Rod admitted it. Clemens and Bonds never admitted it. Yeah, they never admitted it. <laughs> they they, right they lied in the night, so, bro. And they got out of it. Yeah. And it's like also... Usually, you know, usually a jump from the ninth to the 10th year from what I've seen. Like, usually there's a jump, like, from the... From yeah, those who vote. but I mean, they usually have one more year to get in, though, which is... Yeah, yeah. But there's usually a massive jump. Like, they usually will go... Like, if they put in Bonds and Clemens, and what they think they're saying is we are willing to excuse what we believe or perceive to have been clear yeah. evidence of um, performance enhancing drugs that could have been used throughout their careers. The pro- the thing with A-Rod, which why A-Rod is clear cut first ballot Hall of Famer, clear cut, clear cut, yeah. is because he used it for a period of time, admitted to using it at a certain period of time. And so they have evidence of him not on PEDs, how good he was. And I think because of that, because of how good he was when he wasn't on PEDs, I think it's clear cut that he's that he's uh, gonna yeah, be in the well, hall. Bro, Bonds fucking was like one of the only players to steal like thirty bags at thirty home runs and have over yeah. hundred RBIs. He won, I want to say two or three MVPs with the Pirates when he was Skinny Bones Jones out in left field getting winning Gold Gloves. So clearly he wasn't <laughs> yeah. on steroids. Then he came to yeah, Texas, yeah. Won four more MVPs. No, that's MVP. true. He won seven total, and obviously he was yoked at a certain point in time, home run king, but. You gotta give this guy. I think a these, I think they both thing, should man. get in. They both should get in, and I think or give them their own section. The steroid era be. of Hall of Fame. Yeah. I don't know. Who <laughs> cares? At least you're enshrined, bro. That's and what? So for me, with Kurt Schilling, as much of a kook as Kurt, Kurt Schilling has been since he's left the game, I yeah. still think like he was one of the better pitchers of that era. It's undeniable. So I think you got to be able to say. Yes, he said some things that are uncouth. Yes, he's done some things that are uncouth. But when he was an athlete, we're playing, especially towards the end of his career, he was clearly one of the best pitchers. And I think that puts him into the hall. I don't know what kind of games he's playing by trying to get himself off the voting and talking shit to the voters. Like, this is not obviously what you want to do if you want to, you know, if you want to get on, into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Um, but, and he also said something like along the lines of, I don't actually think I deserve to be there. Some nonsense. Of course you do. You wouldn't be upset if you didn't think you, you were supposed to be there. Um, so I do think he'll get in next year. I think the real tough one will be to see if Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens get in because they both got only like 63, 62% of the vote, yeah. something like that. So they have to go up 13% to 75. Um, and the only way that happens is if my, my guess would be that all of the voters decided we're going to punish them for nine years, not put them on the hall. And then the last year we'll give it to them because, because <laughs> they're you know, yeah, they're basically yeah. trolling them because they're like, we want to punish them to, to send a message. We don't yeah. accept anybody who does steroids, but we're willing to put you over the top when it comes down to it, when it comes time is like, are you a hall of famer or not? I don't, I don't like that. I think it should be every year. Are you a hall of famer? Are you not a hall of famer? Simple as that. So it's ridiculous. And that's the other thing too. Like, why is it decided by sports writers? Like they're clearly biased, bro. Mm -hmm. Like clearly biased these sports writers, man. Yeah. Like why, why isn't it like, um, legends that have played or or hall of famers that are already in the league coaches managers gms presidents operations like stuff like that that actually were involved with the goddamn game not just reporting on things that they may or may not have known to be a fact in reality that's insane to me bro like what are you kidding me that's pretty crazy but you know hopefully bonds gets in that's my favorite player of all time uh massive san francisco giants fan as you know yeah uh, obviously yeah crossing my fingers for barry but you know i don't think he gives a shit if he gets in or not he probably does i don't think he like, cares bro i mean i'm sure part of him is like because it is him, part of it is different sure. you know yeah. the hall of fame the baseball hall of fame is more i think there, it, there is definitely more of like it's you're part of this group it's not just about how well you played or how good you were it's about like you're part of this club and it's a club of like you want to be part of that club because yeah. babe ruth was in that club hank aaron's in that club uh may he rest in peace someone else we lost this week i mean just ridiculous. oh my gosh yeah right? so it's it's like oh my gosh i know 
I know, right? It's like, what hell of a week, bro. Just goes the world got out the massive fly swatter win. Bink on all of those, yeah. bro. It's, it's horrible. Thought our 2021 was going to be great, and then this shit happens, you know. But... Make 2021 great again. Yeah. That, again. That's, the, again. that's what we it's all like, need to do. Again, it hasn't even <laughs> happened yet. Uh, yeah, make, just make 2021 great, bro. Like, period. Yeah. Explanation point. Period. But yeah, dude, yeah. I, I think the Hall of Fame is more clicky. It's just the Baseball Hall of Fame is more clicky. And that's why they're, they're setting zero. I think in 2013 was the last time they didn't have anybody uh, go into the Hall. Um, they've only had that happen four or five times in the last 60, 70 years. So they clearly are waiting for the big class of, I think, 2022. And also the 2020 class hasn't been inducted yet because uh, obviously uh, I think Derek Jeter was in that class because of they haven't had the ceremony because of, because of COVID. So I'm assuming that'll just be like, all right, well, we had one class already. And now next year is going to be stacked, just like the NFL uh, is going to be this year. You got Peyton Manning, I think Calvin Johnson. I mean, you've got a stacked class uh, for the NFL uh, Hall of Fame. I think a bunch of first ballot Hall, Hall of Famers are going to be in there. Well, man, you know, let's uh, just kind of last thing, last segue to get into. We could talk about our, our new president, man. We got a new yeah. president. We have. We, we new, talked a little bit about about, office, about him last week. We, we did, uh, but like, let's, let's, let's talk Wednesday. about his first week with all those executive orders, like his record breaking. A lot of them. Executive a lot of orders, executive man. orders. I think a lot of yeah. them are good. Uh, I just want to talk about. Same. Like, Same. I mean, not even we don't even have to talk about one in particular. I just think like he's actually acting on the things he said he was as opposed to like our previous yeah. president who we sh- now shall not say his name um anymore because he's out of, out of, out of sight out of mind his name does not yeah. deserve to be spoken anymore <laughs> but uh so Voldemort let's use that name for instance little Valdi Mort uh little Vald yeah. Aldi Waldi uh he uh you know said all this shit that he was gonna go do and get done and he literally didn't do anything except build a wall that is is now getting and I built one it's totally exploited it was just hilarious now yeah. it's become a total fat meme which is fun. yeah i mean did you hear about the whole thing where they tried to get money from like trump supporters for the wall uh, yeah, yeah yeah they <laughs> the money got the funneled brand, to dude. their bank accounts yeah so like, they're like all the, the campaign f- money they spent is yeah. now been reciprocated so now it's all back in their accounts it's so funny dude yeah it's so hilarious. well done they covered their debts i mean you know good for them i guess and then they got some pardons too so i mean it, it all worked out and the people who who decided to give them money got bamboozled which is unsurprising it's it's their fault at the end of the day yeah. but yeah i'm curious so what were your thoughts on some of these executive orders i think he had 27 total something like that I mean, just a, a crazy number uh what are your thoughts on the ones that like stand out to you i just and, think uh, it's important that he oh where do i start <laughs> it, was a lot of it was a lot uh let me see which one yeah i'm gonna pick um i think just like his effort to get back into the the the, the paris climate accords uh yeah is is to me really important and that's something that is a pressing matter even if people don't want to admit it or not or want to think about it it's obviously a pressing matter not for the america but for the world and also the fact that he's really making a point of emphasis to say that i want to uh, renew and rekindle all these foreign relationships with leaders that were disrespected for the last four years um mm. and he's really making an effort to that through his executive action so i guess on a kind of broader level i really appreciated what he did in terms of that because i think when i'm voting for somebody i want a leader that's gonna be strong on a world uh world spectrum um somebody yeah. that okay if we do go to war god forbid uh he is gonna have a good head on his shoulders to actually be the ideal leader we need level-headed yeah. and make the outlandish decisions that are going to make more conflicts for us uh like we saw in iraq and afghanistan um you know when shit hits fan shit hits yeah fan, how do we get the shit out of the fan and i think biden's somebody that's obviously been in politics 40 plus years relationships with countless generals countless people that know what the hell they're doing and talking about so he could rely upon those relationships to say okay this is the advice we have for you obviously you're the the you're our leader, our president, you're going to make the, the last final decision on what to do, but we're going to supply you with the knowledge and know how, how to do it, what you should be doing and what leaders you need to build great relationships with so they can come to aid you, come to your backing. And also I think like he even supplied 
a resupplied foreign aid to uh, remind me what country was it? Um, it was one of the countries. A lot oh, you mean he stopped? He stopped foreign aid. I think to uh, no, uh, he he gave foreign aid to some country, and I yeah. think he stopped the He's arms deal in Saudi the Arabia. Arms deal, that's right. But he 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 renewed the foreign aid. Says I forgot what country. This is I'm blanking right now, but. Yeah. Uh, that's good, man, because that shows that, you know, we didn't leave you behind these past four years. We're still here for you. We're still trying mm -hmm. to help because, I mean, as much as I don't like America to dabble on different things around the world, yeah. but things yeah. like that with refugees yeah. and the misfortunate, that's like helping the homeless. Yeah. But now that you're doing that, yeah. you need to help the homeless on our home front. That's the next step. Exactly. One thing that exactly. kind of pisses me off, but you know, I hope, hopefully, yep. but that also trickles down to the local level. So there's only so much an executive yeah. president can do in that instance, but, you know, yeah. hopefully this is setting an example that we need to figure it out. What are your thoughts? Yeah, about? I'm in a, I'm in agreement with you on, on that. I think it's good that he got to work quickly. Um, there wasn't too much dramatics about it. He just went straight to what he had to do. Um, I always preferred his domestic policy to his foreign policy. I, I personally thought his domestic policy was pretty much where I am, uh, essentially, um, fiscally, stuff like that. I mean, there's some slight differences here and there, but I yeah. think he's done, he's delivered on that, I think, so far. I mean, you've seen uh, on climate change, you're talking about uh, stopping the building of the Keystone XL pipeline. That's something that a lot of outside activist groups have, have been wanting. Um, and it's also uh, to Canada. Canada, you know, they wanted that to be built for uh, for their for particular reasons, uh, business wise. Um, and he decided, no, I'm, I, I ran. I didn't even run on this, but I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do. I respect that. Um, I also respect him reengaging with the climate uh, with the Paris Climate Accords, um, doing some things on COVID uh, to get out the supply chain to work towards vaccinations. I believe he's got 100 million vaccinations by 100 days. That's his goal. I think it's important that we have goals like that, even if we don't get to them, because it's kind of what we've been missing is having like setting some guidelines, setting some rules, having ambitions, not being scared about them and saying, yeah, look, Sure, the previous administration did not do a good job at this, but guess what? We're going to pick up the slack. We're going to move forward and we're not going to complain about it. We're going to get things done. I think that's why they got in there in the first place. Uh, obviously, like you were talking about on some of the foreign uh, policy decisions, some of the decisions I think have been good so far. I, I agree with the, the uh, banning of the, of the arms sale to Saudi Arabia. I think anybody who's always been talking to me about, you know, we need to make sure that we're disengaged, that we're not getting into these... Uh, 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 these wars that we're not doing these things. That's exactly how you start that process is you have to disengage the arms sales. Um, I, I did not like some of the reporting that they did on the uh, on behalf of, of Biden in regards to the private prisons. He did what yeah. he could in regards to saying that essentially as much as the executive can do in saying we're going to stop the contracts in the future for mm -hmm. private prisons. I think that's great. I think everyone, a lot of people agree with that. Um, but it doesn't mean that obviously private prisons <laughs> just abolish off the planet of the face of the earth. We obviously yeah. are going to have them for a while. It just means we're not going to re up that contract, which is a good thing. So, so far the executive orders have been good. Um, now with where I would kind of say, I, I hope his strategy can get a little better on. I liked when he talked uh, him and his press secretary talking about uh, unity and how he wants to get that done and ask straightforward, like, are you being unifying by, putting forward executive orders that could change over what Trump did. And they said, look, at the end of the day, we're going to do unity on beha behalf of the American people. If voters in Florida who voted for Trump want to raise the minimum wage, we're going to raise the minimum wage because the conservative voters want to raise the minimum wage. Yeah. We're going to do unity with the voters, not unity with the politicians. If they want to come to where the voters are, by all means. I love that. That's how they, that's how Obama should have approached it in 08. That's what Joe Biden's doing now. He's, I think he's learned from some of those mistakes back then. At the same time, I think he has a very, very high possibility of becoming a very popular president in the next few months, if he can do three basic things. And the first thing is um, get out $2,000 stimulus checks. Now, I understand he's yeah. put the number to 1400 because of the initial 600 I would just advise, just give the 2000 to those people under 70 grand, just because he said it. 
And it makes it easy for you to say, I delivered, whether it's 51 votes or 55 votes or however many, you can get Republicans on board because you can make that straightforward and you can say, this is bipartisan. We worked with the Republicans, we got it done. So for all you voters out there who voted for us, vote for us next time. Then you can do uh, something on the pandemic front where you're gonna need to get those vaccines out there. If they can deliver these vaccines and get into people's arms by summertime and we're out of this mess, he'll be very well liked. So if he can do those those two things. And the third thing on foreign policy, don't get us into anything else right now. Work with the work with yeah. the people we've got to work with. Uh, the, I love that he got back into the WHO. Um, get information. Learn about this. What happened in China? Why did this disease? Uh, we know the disease came from there. We want to know why. We want to know how we can prevent it for the future. Let's do these things. Let's get reengaged with other countries to prevent a China. For those who really care about China, you know, economically beating us. Let's do something to prevent that and help our workers. So far, I'm excited about where things are headed. Um, the one thing I will say to Trump, you know, I guess we, I'll say his name, but to the previous president, <laughs> that I'll give him some level of some level of credit on. My biggest worry with him as a leader was always that he was all over the place, is that one yeah. day he's thinking this, the next day is that. I'd rather have a president who's straightforward, who knows what he or she believes in, and is honest with people. And he's none of that, <laughs> whether you like him or not. The reality I is, is that he did... He did buck the military establishment, meaning he he didn't have, like you were talking about with the generals, there's some good generals. And then there's some people who are in, who know private contractors. And so their job will be to what? Like to make sure that those private contractors are continuing to profit, whether or not we're in war or not. And I, that's my biggest worry has always been on foreign policy, never domestic policy, is I care a little bit more about how we engage the world, whether it's diplomacy or through uh, like a George Bush type policy of engagement and intervention. Yeah. I think I think Joe Biden's going to be more diplomatic than people think, because I think he has a legacy that, that he's got to build. I think he realizes the place of where this country is at. I think he gets that this country right now cannot go to war again. I mean, it'd be deeply unpopular to do, deeply unpopular. And to Trump's credit, even though he threw a bomb here and there and he made some dumbass decisions, we didn't get into another war with him. That is one thing, the only thing I'll give him credit on through his presidency really is probably that. And before the (laughs) pandemic hit jobs and the economy. I think those two things are the things he did good. Everything else, leadership wise, he pretty much failed. That's Obama's economy, man. Yeah, that's true. And uh, that's true. (laughs) Obama built that economy. He just didn't fuck it up until the pandemic and then he fucked it up. So, you know, there's a lot of shit there, but now it's time for fixing. It's time for healing. I think that we as people have got to, as people who, look, if you voted for Joe Biden and you won, don't rub it into people's faces. Try to bring them along. Talk to people who voted the other way or didn't participate and speak to them and engage in honest conversation. We're never going to get anywhere with us at each other thro- at each other's throat 24-7 because we'll never be able to truly find common ground. And the common ground are generally good things. Like most of the people that I know who are young and conservative, mm-hmm. they think that some of this stuff that we saw to, uh, this week and in the stocks uh in regards to the GameStop thing is kind of fucked up they're like yes there should be some government regulation to prevent these companies from doing this or they'll be like we need to do something on big tech and censorship something we can agree on because me and you agree we need civil liberties we need to make sure we're not giving the mark zuckerbergs of the world too much power so there's so much ways we can come together i hope that this is the beginning of that and not uh the end you know yeah bro I agree, man. To Joe, it's next four years, Joe Kamala, man. But uh, you know, just to yeah. wrap it up, uh, ladies and gents, uh, you know, we got our tournament going on. So let's give you a little update on the Yeezy bracket. So we're in our final round. Uh, last we had Stronger defeat Heartless, Gold Digger beat Runaways. So now Gold Digger and Stronger for the finale. I'm gonna have to. Uh, this is actually really hard here. Um, who are you going with, bro? Gold Digger. I like Gold Digger. I personally like it as a song. It's what comes to mind when I think of Kanye. Yeah. Um, I and know. Maybe that's just the mainstream in me. I'm going to have to go with Gold Digger, too. But it's a very mm-hmm. tough answer. Hmm. But I'll probably say Gold Digger just because, like, I grew up with that song. I grew up with Stronger, too, but Gold Digger was, like, that was, like, the first Kanye album I was really on was Late Registration, which is still my favorite. And I think Gold Digger is just such an iconic song. And like you said, everyone thinks Kanye West. Oh, yeah, the guy who did Gold Digger, he, he obviously. Yeah. 
and knows who Kanye West is, but that's like his iconic song. Stronger is also iconic. Yeah. He has so many iconic Stronger songs too. that were yeah. also defeated in this uh, tournament, yep. but I'm going to have to go with yep. Gold Diggers, so I guess we're in agreement there, bro. Uh, but yeah, it was cool, man. It was interesting to see how people vote. A lot of people, I think, vote um, mainstream. Mainstream, mainstream, right? It's pretty uh, mainstream. Mindset, because a lot of these songs that I lost, I'm like, damn, you clearly don't really listen to the albums that much. Yeah. Which is fair, yeah. whatever. People are just... Not a lot of people are like in tune with music industry and things like that, as maybe I am or some other people are. Um, but that's fine. <laughs> Way to take a shot, bro. You just took a shot at all our voters, bro. You're like, bro, you ain't. That's a facts, bro. That's, a fact. that's one thing too. Like, I've, I've I've heard from people like, oh, I don't really listen to music. I'm like, what? Like, yeah, I, yeah. you can I listen to the, listen like to at least that's yeah. Like, that's like such a staple of life and living. No, that's not, when anyone says that is bullshit, that's not true. They mean, yeah. I guess they don't listen to music on the reg, like they don't like to calm themselves or to do, they totally listen, everyone listens to music. Yeah, but everyone's like, oh, I like that song, let me music. check it out when I get home. actively listen to music. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but, mm. uh, all right, that's just, that's just the weirdos, I guess, but. <laughs> I would go with, I think I would go with Heartless, bro. Heartless is my favorite Kanye West song. That might be surprising, over, but I. Over Stronger? Over stronger, over stronger, and and the reason why is stronger is the more. I mean, they're both pretty mainstream. Stronger is the more mainstream song. You yeah. hear it more often. Heartless to me, every time when I think of Kanye, I think of In old Kanye. Night, I think of new I Kanye, and I think of Heartless. Cold that's that song. Story. It's like a yeah, deep song. So. The music videos don't like animated. Auto-tune. I love. Right. Yeah, exactly. It is. It is auto tune, but it works, and it's like, and and there's <laughs> lyrics to it that I actually. It's basic, clear, straightforward, and I get. And there's just a vibe to it that I like love. And that's to me, Kanye, I think at his best. You know what Kanye is. needs? Kanye needs a song called Heart Filled. You know? Heart Filled. Heart Filled. Heartbroken. Heartbroken uh, now. Heartbroken I'm now, heartbroken. Bro. Kim K. <laughs> Ray J came back in I that picture and I am strong again. <laughs> Next thing you know, Kanye West, I'm born of. Like, what? What did he do now? Kanye West only fans. Kanye West and Ray J. <laughs> Brothers in Arms, Pornhub.com. Like, dude. Jeez. And do, do you think it's fair to not? Nah, never mind. That's a great I song, Brothers in Arms, by the way. Anyway, that's, that's, a, that's a great joking. song, Brothers in Arms. Love that song. That's, yeah. Have you heard it? Brothers yeah, in I Arms. Have, Amazing I have. song. It's one of my favorite songs. I have. Um, yeah. Shout out to U.S. Military. I mean, that's not really super relevant. Yeah. But Brothers in Arms, that's like you think military. Brothers in Arms is based on that, yeah. Exactly. Uh, anyway, man. Let's get the fuck out of Irish here. Um, had a good. All right, bro. That was fun with Sam. Shout out, Sam. Uh, everybody, yeah. obviously. As Small. usual, like, subscribe, share with all your friends and buddy old pals out there. Ladies, men, women, whatever you identify him, her, he, she, they, them, whatever the hell you want to do today. But uh, that's 21st century. It's 2021. It's the world we live in today. I don't know what you want to identify as. <laughs> Choose you, do you. If you're a fairy, if you're a fucking unicorn, whatever the fuck you is. Do you, man. Have a good day. We out of here. Do you do? Peace signing off. Hit it, T. He's signing off. Yeah, there, yeah, there. All right, people. Peace and love, everybody.